All right, guys, today we're supposed to cover population ecology and I, uh, I'm gonna do it. Hello. I'm gonna use a little bit of the PowerPoint just so I can run you through some of the basics of the things that we're gonna talk about. But first, I wanna frame this in the light of something applicable to what the heck is going on in the world. So I found this paper about the ecology of coronaviruses that was published um, a little over 10 years ago, which is kind of crazy to think about. Um, and then frame all of our understanding about population ecology, or at least the basics in light of the spread of coronavirus and uh, by first investigating how we figure out uh, the original host, the original animal host for the virus. So I found this super cool paper. It's it's a lot of complicated phylogeny in here, but I want to kind of run you through it. Uh, your PowerPoint presentation starts off with some basics. Let me see if I can. So I've got this weird camera arm, y'all. Let me try and not make you guys sick. Um, I've got this weird camera arm that I'm going to try to bend. Maybe I can just point it here and just point some things out for y'all first, just to kind of walk you through some of the parts of this that I would walk you through if we were in class together. Does that work? Looks like it might work. It's a little bouncy. I'm trying not to get nauseous. Okay, so in class we would talk about various sampling techniques, um, how on earth we would count a particular number of species in a particular given area, we talk, talk, talk about quadrat sampling and using matrices. And if you're in ecology lab, if you when you take ecology lab, if you take it, which is most of you, because you're going to need six labs anyways, you might get to do this, depending on how well organized your TA is. Uh, in field ecology, we'll talk in more detail about these methods. But you can use matrices and quadrats where you basically, obviously, really basic probability you just mark off of a particular area and you sample uh, the number of individuals in that particular area and you scale it up for the number of individuals uh, to estimate the number of individuals in, in a total population. We do this kind of thing all the time. And like I said, uh, we'll do this kind of thing with animal sightings in ecology lab, and we'll get into more of this if you take field ecology with me, but just a basic understanding of how we scale population estimations. Um, if you've ever seen this picture of me, uh, it's on the faculty webpage and the bio website and all kinds of stuff. Uh, it's just a, me holding this owl because I did a bunch of research where I would trap owls. Uh, maybe, can I angle this to you guys? Maybe that's a little bit better. Well, then you get a glare, so I don't know what's better or not. That's Dr. Richard Beauregard. He's the ornithologist that I studied under. He lived in the jungle for a really long time. Um, maybe I'll expand this so that you can actually see what's going on. He lived in the jungle for a really long time in the Amazon, learning how to trap owls with this cool thing called a balsha tree, where we would just build these cages and then put bait in them like uh, different songbirds and so forth and put little tiny little foot nooses on top of them don't worry it doesn't hurt them at all and then barred owls will come by and they'll try to grab this prey item and they'll get their feet caught up and then we can grab them and we can weigh them upside down and most of them are pretty nice this this was uh, an owl her name was rose most of them were pretty nice. The weird thing about owls, you grab their feet, a lot of times they just start to relax. Uh, some of them will try to peck your face off. And particularly uh, when they had just laid a clutch of eggs, we would climb these giant ladders and check on their babies. And the moms would try to dive bomb our heads, so we'd wear uh, lacrosse helmets to keep us from getting killed. Um, in fact, I've done a lot of sketchy things in my life, rock climbing and so forth, but uh, probably the sketchiest thing that I've done is being the top of like a 30-foot ladder trying to check on some baby owlets while the mama tries to knock us off the ladder. Some scary stuff. So anyways, we would just put radio uh, backpacks on these guys. We, we, we used to go to the craft shop and get some, some uh, 
different types of fabric to build these backpacks and we would put radio transmitters on them so we could track their population size and we found out all kinds of cool things like barred owls this is a common one around charlotte and you can hear their call it's like that who cooks for you who cooks for you mnemonic where it's like and it used to be thought that they needed tons of track big tracks of large old growth forests to survive but it turns out that they do not need that. Sorry, this GIF is probably wigging you guys out. Um, and we figured that out by tracking their uh, their uh, overall habitat ranges. We did a similar project with ospreys, and Dr. Beauregard actually figured out something. This is a young picture of him. He's pretty. He's quite. A, he's an older gentleman these days. But uh, we figured out also an ospreys using satellite backpacks that they would piggyback on uh, hurricanes and storms. And if you had me for another class, you probably heard me talk about that project before. But we'd also put backpacks on uh, on owls. Anyways, uh, your book also talks about some examples of other animals. Bears are really cool. <sighs> Bears have this really, uh, as a, as a um, high trophic level predator, they're really important in a lot of large scale habitats. One of the coolest stories ever. Um, it, you see quite often in a nature documentary where the the bears eat the salmon and then they uh, go into the woods and they poop in the forest and then the slugs and the flies help break that poop down and then the salmon and the DNA from all the other creatures ends up in the redwoods. It's just a really cool demonstration of the circle of life. Um, but essentially, if we were in class, I would be asking you, like, you know, how do you think we sample grizzly bear sizes and so forth? And we just put radio tags on them. And uh, if you ever see bears like this, we do the same thing with elk in North Carolina. It's just so that we can keep track of their populations and monitor the health of these individuals. So just to kind of narrow this down, to give you like a speed course and population ecology, what essentially we do is we look at a number of different demographic characteristics of a population and we see how that population changes. And maybe we do the same thing for predator and prey within a particular population to see how one is affecting the other. And usually we start off by looking at certain age classes and different species reach sexual maturity at different ages. But if you use whole numbers, like I don't know, maybe you have a thousand number of individuals and whatever, it doesn't matter, the particular species in a population, we could look at how many of them survive. So if, you know, if, if 424 of a thousand of them survive, we can say that there's a certain um, survivorship percentage. And then we can look at what's called age-specific fecundity. And when we get in, into ecology, y'all, we spend, we spend half the semester looking at demographic characteristics and mathematically analyzing them so that we can simulate population change and, and, and examine effects in populations. So we can look at age-specific fecundity, and that's just the number of uh, babies a mama is, is having in a particular year. And you can see that they have to be a certain age in most populations before they start having babies. And then you can look at the average number of births per female for a year, and that's just the number of survivors that are female that are having babies, and you can multiply these two survivorship um, by age-specific fecundities to figure out that, how many average births per year from the original surviving females that we have in a particular population. And then oftentimes we'll add all those up over a specific length of time, and we'll get these uh, net reproductive rates. Okay, so just a real quick speed through of, uh, of, of demographic analysis or demographic characteristics in a population, okay? Oftentimes we'll also uh, analyze mortality, how many of these individuals are dying off. But like I said, I just want to get to uh, this cool example. I guess cool is probably not the right word, but insightful example in this coronavirus paper here in a little bit, okay? So um, just to kind of speed through these, there's different survivorship curves based on the species because different species live their lives in different ways. So you can have, for example, individuals that have high survivorship early on in their life and die quickly as they get older. Um, 
And this can be things, depending on how you phrase this, this can be creatures like certain types of mammals. Uh, it could be low survivorship early on and then high survivorship as individuals increase in age. And these are like most plants, especially trees, right? Most tree seedlings, 99% of them don't survive. They all die off. But once you get a, a good, hardy, strong tree, then they survive uh, very well as they get older. And then there are some species that exhibit the steady survivorship curve. And, uh, you know, depending on who you talk to, you could argue humans have a pretty steady survivorship curve. So this is just a breakdown of all these kinds of things, right? So we, we uh, um, as technology has increased, humans are probably more approximating closer towards that type two curve. But through history and as a general uh, rule of thumb, humans generally uh, survive well until we get old and then we get sick and then we don't make it. Um, other species that have that, you know, let's go back. So, right, we're babies, we're young, we're healthy, we're not making it. Or we uh, have good, we have good uh, modern technology. We're born in a, uh, in a highly developed area of the planet. Um, we have access to lots of good resources and maybe we have a more steady survivorship curve. Evolutionarily, history-wise though, we're more of a type one. Type two, uh, what the heck are type two? I think a lot of birds, what did it say? Yeah, a lot of birds have this where they just have constant survivorship. Um, basically, the same number of them live and die as they are born until they get older. And then, like I mentioned, many plants, type 3 curves. So, just life history traits. There's this trade-off between, uh, there's certain characteristics we see in, in, in plants right, where they have a um, low survivorship early on, but they have high fecundity, meaning they give off a tiny million little babies. I love this example of the palm tree just because palms are super, super tough trees. You can see how crazy this one grew just because it's, it's, they're really adept at surviving storms and so forth. But most plants, tons of offspring, um, they essentially mature quickly. Uh, a lot of insects, for example, are all tiny who have this high fecundity, low survivorship. And then you can see as we get into things like, you know, people, elephants, and so forth, larger mammals, they have very few offspring, they have giant offspring, you know, sometimes giant, giant, like whales, right? Large body size, and then resistant to predators, and we live a long time. So there's this trade-off in this life history continuum. So now... Before we get into population growth rates, there's all these, uh, I make this comment, you know, numbers ahead, danger, 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 and usually we talk about all this theory, but I'm not going to do that. What I'm going to do is we're going to use this paper and talk about these concepts. So, let me fix this real quick. So, sorry guys, I promise, I'm just going to try and... Steady, steady the steady arm. Okay, so this paper looks into evolutionary insights of the ecology of coronaviruses by examining using gene data. Uh, oh, and I'm gonna have to pull this up, hold on. Using gene data of uh, hold on. Okay, so Try to study this thing. Okay, so this paper essentially uses gene data to analyze a number of characteristics in relation to different strains of coronaviruses. And I'm gonna try and give you the simplest breakdown of this extremely complex phylogenetic study. So you're gonna see and run into papers a lot like this in your life. And it's really kind of complicated to figure out what the heck's going on. And what's going on here is that these coronaviruses have been grouped to, in have been grouped according to specific um, vectors of infection and according, and according to phylogenetic relatedness. So essentially the way that these things are figured out, in addition to using extremely complex algorithms, we're going to pay as much attention as we can to this group right here, this 4B group, because this is where COVID-19 is. Okay, but but uh, there's a number of different um, pig, beef, beef, probably the wrong word, cow, pig, um, 
human strains that are interdispersed amongst this relatedness. You can see here's a human strain here, a human strain over here. Uh, but this 4B group right here um, is where we see the current COVID-19 infection. And so the, basically, y'all, the way they figured these out is exactly like, if you can remember going back to 2120 or 20 or early on in this semester, I can't remember which one it was. But remember, if we look at A, A, T, I don't know, G, G, C. If we look at a gene sequence for, let's say this is, you know, whatever, coronavirus one, right? And then you compare that to a, another sequence um, let's say G, G, G. Okay, well, there's one little difference here. Remember how we can create that phylogenetic relatedness? Because that's another coronavirus here. Well, we do this for very specific genes. Um, the genes that they analyzed in this paper, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just pause this and then point it back at the computer so I stop dragging you guys around with me. So y'all remember this? So this is this life cycle of um, coronaviruses. And without getting into any details, the only things I really wanna bring your attention to are a couple of things. So number one, these spike proteins on the outside that serve as, as uh, receptors on the virion. virion. Uh, we have these spike proteins, you can see them being manufactured down here uh, later on in the life cycle that, that serve as receptors for the virus, right? They bind to receptors in cells and the cell membrane, and they're important for that binding aspect of viral infection. Also, the nucleocapsid, which is just essentially a protein coat that wraps up that uh, viral um, mRNA. And remember, this is positive sense strand coronavirus, so mRNA can use can be used to directly transcribe and create all of these different viral elements. In addition to that, which is not on this life cycle, another one of the things that they use in this paper is helicase. And, uh, hold on, pause. And so for helicase, and helicase, y'all, um, okay, so mRNAs don't just float around like in these single sequences, right? So if this was like coronavirus mRNA, they don't just float around like this single, the, usually these strands are rolled over on themselves for packaging purposes. And these things are called duplexes. Anyways, um, helicase, which is important for the unwinding of DNA during DNA replication, also serves very, very important roles in viral replication as well for translation into proteins and in unwinding this original package of RNA that we see in viruses, okay? So helicase is also highly conserved in viruses, so it's usually used in phylogenetic studies. So for helicase and spike surface, cell surface markers or um, receptors on the surface of the virus that bind with the cell, rather, and then for that nucleocapsid, nucleocapsid, they did this where essentially they were just analyzing, comparing and contrasting gene sequences for these specific genes. And then they use these really complex algorithms. And of course, this is a gross oversimplification because they do this for all the genes within these proteins and then statistically compare um, their similarity. This is how they figure out though, which subsets of these viruses are similar and which are different because everywhere you see a difference, like let's say we've got another sequence within the genes that code for spike proteins. Let's say uh, GCC. So now we've got two differences compared to that original sequence, right? Then we can see that there's a difference here for the genes that are important in the viral protein manufacture. So this is how, in an extremely complex manner, we figure out the similarities and differences between these different strains of viruses here, okay? And then the ones that are more similar, we group together. These things are usually rooted with some highly conserved viral type, like torovirus or something, I think is what they use, which is just a, which is a bovine virus that has 
very, very basic rudimentary genes in comparison to these things that have all mutated through time, okay? So this is how they group and classify the similarity and relatedness between all these different coronaviruses. And you can see, you hear, oh, you know, this tiger at the, z at the zoo in New Jersey just ended up with this coronavirus infection. Sure, probably, because there's a million different strains of coronavirus, which a lot of people don't realize to begin with, right? They think that there's like two or three floating around out there. So this is how we figure out similarity versus difference. Now, yuck, look at that chart. Let's look at some other things that they analyze. Like how about this? This assigns dates to these similarities. So once again, focusing on this 4B group, hopefully you can see that. You can see this 4B group. Okay, well, we have data from phylogenetic mapping that essentially gives us an estimation of how quickly these genes that we looked at, come on, these genes, sequences and genes related to proteins that are important in viral replication, we have data about how quickly these genes mutate over time. So we compare the current mutations to previous ones and see how quickly these mutations between these different types came about, okay? So if you've got, okay, well, and then we reverse engineer this phylogenetic tree time based on how quickly these mutations accumulate, okay? So we're like, if we look at something recent, right? All right, well, we know how long it took us to go from this civet SARS strain to this SARS CoV strain right here, right? This is just a different type or strain of virus. We know, okay, well, this last common ancestor to this one, right? And these are not actual last common ancestors. These are viral strains, but you guys know how to think about phylogenetics that way, right? We look and see how long it took to go from this strain of virus to this strain of virus based on mutation rate in comparison to how quickly we know certain viruses mutate over time. And then we estimate how long it took for this difference to accumulate. Now we can do that with real data for these things, right? And then we, we can reverse engineer that time estimation based on differences between all these other virus strains. And in that way, we can get time estimations for how long it took these mutations to occur amongst all of these groups of coronaviruses, right? Which is why you can see, okay, well, group 4A and 4B probably had a divergence back in 1961, just using these time estimations, right? And then you can see, okay, well, the last time we had this bat-specific strain in coronaviruses, was all the way back to this lineage hundreds of years ago based on current modeling data. And these are obviously just estimations based on current mutation rates between the strains that we are familiar with and that we do know. But because of that, we can make estimations on the last time there was this shared uh, relatedness between all of these groups of strains of coronavirus. So as long as you got a very general understanding for that, that's just how you navigate these things, okay? now. What we can do is we can also take the rate of current mutation and we can compare that to um, models of what we know are relevant for um, natural selection to be occurring. So we have a good understanding of if viruses are mutating quick enough, we know at certain rates we have um, we have drastic and significant selective pressures going on. And so we can compare, okay, well, it seems like in these couple strains, we have significant rates of change in comparison to what we understand to be the case for recombination, um, very, very quick viral mutation is what we're gonna say to grossly oversimplify that, okay? But that gives you an idea of um, how we go about comparing these things. Now, let me show you guys the next part. Okay, so then, okay, so we know that there's a couple different strains that experience significant change over time. That is, there's rapid change in those viral strains. And we can compare 
the changes to certain population models, which is what we're going to talk about next, okay? And we can see, okay, well, we have a couple strains in, in groups of coronaviruses that are experiencing exponential growth. Well, we're definitely familiar with one of those, right? Because COVID-19 is experiencing exponential growth. And I'll, I'll give you a really silly, oversimplified model of how we can understand exponential growth in a little bit. But then we can look at certain groups of coronaviruses and see that their models of change are not changing at a significant rate. And what that allows or allowed these scientists to do was to essentially deduce, well, that for all the groups of coronaviruses, the only host strains that are not and have not experienced significantly rapid changes in their viral genome over time have been bats. They have these constant, they have constant uh, population numbers, right? Or constant infection numbers or constant, uh, rates of mutation in the strains of those viruses that correlate with all of those other factors, okay? And because of that, it's likely that bats are the original progenitors of coronavirus strains. Now, it doesn't mean there's no intermediate host, and we talked about how at that market in Wuhan, there's a lot of other things there, right? Which means there can be an intermediate host, like a pangolin or, you know, whatever those other bizarre, like a wolf puppy or whatever else that was there at that exotic meat uh, market. So there can be intermediate hosts, but we know strains in group four, four B specifically, are have experienced exponential um, mutational rates and growth over time. So as a result of that, we can deduce that um, they're in specific groups based on their similarity of relatedness and their phylogenies. And we can compare that to strains or groups that have not changed to deduce the original progenitor. Now, the next thing I want to kind of talk about is what the heck exponential growth even looks like and what that even means, okay? So, exponential growth is something that you don't see in a lot of natural populations unless there's a significant change. And typically, you refer to exponential growth in terms of natural animal populations, but you can also look at it. Uh, in terms of going viral, uh, like, you know, when something is increasing in popularity and exponential rate, and literally we can look at going viral in viruses. So, um, if we look at, let's say we have time zero, right? And then time one, two, three, four, whatever. Uh, what we can look at is this rate of change in the population, usually indicated by R, and we can examine um, how many individuals survive and how many are born in a population as, uh, as a population of creatures or organisms uh, goes through time, right? So let's say maybe at time zero, we've got 10 individuals in this population. And let's say, uh, let's say, um, I don't know, let's say we've got, five new babies in this population over time. And then let's say we've got two uh, deaths over time. And then we want to divide that out of the 10 total individuals in this population. And in that way, we can look at this rate of change in this population. So five minus two is three over 10 is 0.3, right? And then we can just take that 0.3 and apply that to the number of individuals in the total population to see how that's changed, right? So, and that, that'll that be three, and then we add that to the total number of individuals in the population so that we figure out the next generation or point in time, we've got 13 individuals. So we can keep this, we can keep this going, right? But like, this is more, this is definitely more of a number in a natural population. What happens in viruses is insane, you guys. Like, let's say, let's say we had, Let's say we had four individuals. And this and viruses this is called R naught. And you've probably heard this in the news at some point. So let's say we had four individuals, and let's say each one of these individuals uh get, has the pop let's say three of these individuals gave the uh gave the virus to um four other people. So let's say gave it to 12 people. So that's essentially like 12 quote unquote births or whatever. And then let's say 
one of these people, one of these four, didn't give it to the four possible people that they could have. And then, okay, 12 minus four equals eight. And then uh, divide that by the total number of four people. And then we've got an R naught of two, right? So we've got an R naught of two, which means, and there's a way simpler way <laughs> to think about this. That just means that every person gives it to two more people. And this is actually more, more realistic. Coronavirus, COVID-19 has an R naught close to two. And this is exactly what exponential growth is, right? Because then these individuals give it to two people and then these individuals give it to two people. Like I'm just writing over my old math. And this is exponential change. If you graph this, it looks like this, right? This is exponential change. This is what viral infection looks like. Now, we know that natural populations only exhibit exponential change for a brief period of time. And in fact, let me see if I can find the coronavirus numbers, the current coronavirus numbers. And then let's see. Yeah, we go to this World Meter site. And you can actually look, right? You can look. Hold on, let me pause it so I don't shake you guys around everywhere. Yeah, now what does that look like, y'all? That looks like exponential growth. Quite literally, we're right in the middle of exponential growth. Uh, we can, oh, let's talk about, we won't get complicated with this. Um, we're right in the middle of exponential growth. Now, this can only continue realistically for so long, right? Because what we end up having is, uh, here, let me point this down in this paper again. Okay, now, hopefully this doesn't wig you guys out because it's like a bunch of small numbers on an Excel spreadsheet. But what ends up happening is logarithmic growth, right? There's something that's going to control or cap or limit our population growth eventually, right? And the, the, this is the scary thing to think about with coronavirus because what's going to limit that is is way up in the air, you know? And this is called the carrying capacity, right? The carrying capacity for any population of living things is limited by resource amount, right? And these can be density dependent, meaning that like you're running out of food uh, in a particular area or environment over time, or they can be density independent things, which are usually things uh, that we consider like catastrophe. Something comes along and wipes out a huge portion of the, the population by chance, like we see um, during a population bottleneck or so forth, and that obviously is going to drastically limit your carrying capacity. But all these crazy numbers up here was just me using real numbers to model logarithmic change um, for coronavirus. So let me show you guys a, a couple. So here's the real problem. We don't know. Um, so this, let me see if you guys can see this a little bit. This one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, blah, 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 blah. We don't know what that is, right? We don't know if it's days. Um, it's ba Now it looks like it's basically one every three days is essentially what this block of time would be simulated as. But here's what I did, okay? I took and I expressed as a decibel hundreds of thousands of people and then subtracted that from uh, the possible number of total humans in the American population. I just went ahead and rounded to 300 million because, you know, we're at like 330 or something. Let's say just 3D, 30 million people can't get the, the virus for some random reason. Maybe they're not the right demographic. Uh, maybe they're hiking the Appalachian Trail, right? There's a lot of different random reasons that uh, just a chunk of the human population, the, the American population would not get it, right? So I use point three to estimate, um, hundreds of thousands of people who currently have the virus, right? It's something like 300,000 people. And then you can take this formula that takes the carrying capacity. And like I said, for this first estimation, I'm just estimating the carrying capacity to be around 300 million people. Let's say there's no limiting factor. Let's say, focus. Let's say there's no limiting factor outside of the fact that there's a total population and um, probably freaky enough, during a global pandemic, the only limiting population might be our number. We are the hosts for coronavirus. So uh, the only limiting factor might be total population number. Okay, so we can use, we can, we'll, we'll say that that's the carrying capacity for this virus. We are its resource, right? 
So if you take 300 million people minus 300,000 people and divide it by 300 million people, what you get is this, um, this difference between the carrying capacity and the population, okay? And then you can use that and you can multiply the number of individuals by that difference according to the carrying capacity to figure out the number of people in the population changing over time um, or the number of individuals who are essentially going to uh, get coronavirus, okay? And then you can model this, right? So then you come down to the next population number because you took the number of individuals um, who uh, are going to get it and added that to the number of people who obviously have it. And then you're going to get a new percentage that's going to factor in to the uh, change that the effect of the carrying capacity is going to have over it. And then you're going to continually add how many people get coronavirus in relation to how many people then have it based on this logarithmic growth, okay? So then if you don't understand the math behind this, don't even worry about it. Let me just demonstrate for you uh, what this looks like, right? So we can essentially model this and you've seen things similar to this in the news, right? So let's just get rid of that. So we can look at the number of individuals getting coronavirus as it approaches some imaginary, uh, although very real, that what's imaginary about it is we have no idea what this carrying capacity number is, right? Although it does exist. There is a carrying capacity for this disease. So we can look at and see as we approach this carrying capacity, the number of individuals who are getting coronavirus over time is going to go up and peak because we're going to have the maximum amount of change somewhere in the middle here as we're approaching getting close to our carrying capacity. And then it's going to drop off because there's no more people left to infect as we get closer to the maximum number of people who will get infected, right? Assuming that we have um, this infection rate be consistent over time. Now, how much we can influence these things is, is different, right? So over here, what I did was set the carrying capacity to 150 million. That's half the American population, less than half the American population, right? But one of the things that you'll notice as we graph this out is that What's different is the scale, right? It looks the same. We still have some maximum amount of individuals who are going to have coronavirus at one particular time as we approach this maximum carrying capacity. As long as we have this consistent infectious rate, um, we're obviously trying to change that through quarantining and so forth. But here's, here's what I don't understand when I watch a lot of people in the media. So what's different is the scaling between these two charts. Overall, they look the same though, right? And that's because the, this growth, for any sig uh, ignoring a million different factors, which by the way, um, I don't think really play an overly important role because there are so many people on the planet still like we may be locked up and we, we're not, we're limiting our movements for sure, but eventually we're still gonna have some set number reach the carrying capacity for the number of individuals who will be infected by this virus. We're still gonna have a point in time, um, and Wuhan thinks that they've already seen this, where the maximum amount of people over time have this, are getting this infection. They've just reopened, uh, and now we'll see if there's any amount of resurgence, right? Because if you cut off, right? If we all lock everybody inside right here, right here, what does that mean? Does it mean that we're never gonna reach the carrying capacity for that particular population growth? No, it doesn't. It still means that there's still some maximal amount of individuals who will get infected. There's still some maximum amount of, there's still some carrying capacity limit, right? So if we send everybody home in Wuhan and then everybody comes back out, and they never reach that carrying capacity, which we don't know what it is, then there'll be resurgence, right? We'll still see the number of individuals reaching some limit. And maybe that carrying capacity is now down here, right? Maybe it's lower now. I just changed that axis, sorry. Um, 
Maybe the carrying capacity is lower, but there's still a carrying capacity there. Now, maybe Wuhan already reached their carrying capacity, and as a result of that, they're going to go back to life as we know it, and everything is going to be um, ideal, and that's going to be great because then um, we'll have already reached the maximum number of individuals who are going to be infected. Now, here's the thing, right? We can really lower that carrying capacity if... Uh, we reach some type of herd immunity. That is, so many people have had the virus that not that there's not enough individuals to hop around from um, individual to individual for infection rates to increase again. Or if we have some type of uh, vaccine, which I'm sure you've heard would take, if we did it faster than we've ever done in history, would still take a year and a half, right? Um, so last thing I want to point out, how do we change this if it seems like the carrying capacity is inevitable? What can we do? Well, we're looking at infection rates. We're not looking at, um, we are not looking at mortality rates, right? So let me show you something. You've probably seen this before, and I'm just going to do something absolutely ridiculous to show it in the easiest way possible. So what's the main thing that we can change about population growth? that's logarithmic for an infection that's a global pandemic. Well, we can do this to it, right? We can do this, and let's ignore the axes for a little bit. What we can do is limit the number of individuals who at any one particular time have the virus, and you've heard this flattening the curve term. And if we look at quite literally um, mathematical modeling for population growth and we skew, we drag the time out that the number of individuals at any one particular time have this virus. This is what they talk about in limiting hospital strain um, so that we have enough capability medically to treat individuals and that will drastically increase our survivability. That's how we change the skew of this population growth because there is some set carrying capacity. How much we can influence it, we'll never know. You'll hear people make all kinds of estimations, but we really won't know. Nobody can can make any true estimation of it. I can tell you, though, that this exists. If we cut off and we're all locked inside here, 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 and here, there's still a carrying capacity. The number of people who are going to get this infection are still going to get this infection probably just because of its scale. There's a million different variables, and this is a gross oversimplification, and of course I could be wrong, but according to just basic population growth, this is a set number. So what we can do is we can skew the number of individuals who have this virus at any one particular time so that we can maximize the ability to treat these individuals, which you've been hearing about in the news. But I just wanted to point out using actual models of how we estimate population growth and different factors that in influence and limit this population growth, right? These density independent factors like catastrophe and so forth, probably not in the foreseeable future. But what we do have is density dependent factors that are going to limit the maximum that is this uh carrying capacity for this particular virus, but probably not that much, right? Because we're humans and we get Amazon Prime packages and we still walk around outside with our shoes on the greenway that we then bring inside and everywhere this virus is, uh, we are also, right? But that's not to say we cannot skew the timeline and make it much more easily handleable, okay? So I just wanted to use some real mathematical modeling, something relevant, a paper about coronaviruses, kind of give you a breakdown of how the heck we've um, deduced the original progenitor of the viruses in this particular strain with this paper, right? Boom. That is 13 years old, which is crazy, right? And then also kind of give you a breakdown of how we figure out phylogenetic relatedness between different viral strains by using different infectious proteins to estimate similarities and sequences. And then comparing that to how much those sequences have changed over time with real data from real viruses, right? From real strains that we have, like the most recent SARS outbreak. And then reverse engineering that relatedness based on mutation rate to figure out specific times so that we can make estimations of how long ago 
various strains of coronavirus diverged from one another and became um, distinct strains themselves. And then we can look at the rates of those mutations and compare them to certain models. And we can see that in models where we have constant population change, that is, there's no significant difference, uh, that those are probably hosts for the virus that have built up immunity, so there is not a significant change in that viral strain. Um, and that's what we see in bats, right? Bats do not experience bat pandemics as a result of coronaviruses because they evolved slowly in conjunction with them, whereas when it made the zoonotic leap to us, we are experiencing exponential growth in our population and are currently right in the middle of it literally, right? Right in the middle of it literally, which is why we can see these exponential growth patterns with real data. And then we can make estimations based on our current number of cases in the U.S., what the logarithmic curve will look like, though we cannot know what the actual carrying capacity is, and we cannot know how many individuals will end up with coronavirus at any one particular time, though we can try and drastically skew the timeline that these infections occur. Um, so we can try and limit carrying capacity a number of ways, right? We can carry, we can, we can only send out healthy individuals um, that try their absolute best in some amazing way to limit their exposure to any susceptible, overly susceptible populations, and we can skew how many individuals get this virus at any one particular time by dragging out the amount of time um, or skewing the timeline for essentially interactions between people, and this is what quarantine, quarantining, wow, quarantining does, um, as well as social distancing, the whole point is skewing that timeline because we're still approaching, we're still headed to some carrying capacity, but the only thing we can do is affect the rate at which we approach it, okay? Um, we can try and limit our carrying capacity, but in, in, given the scale of this issue, I, I think we probably can't influence it in some significant way. So, um, I don't, I'm not showing you these things to freak you out, right? They shouldn't freak you out. We could model this for a million different types of things, um, but I wanted to make it applicable and uh, practical in your understanding so that you have a good idea how to use your knowledge of um, biology to navigate the way all of these things work and how to understand um, <laughs> a viral population and exponential logarithmic growth in a viral population, especially uh, during this time, okay? So if you have any specific questions, reach out to me, shoot me an email, message me, uh, whatever, and I'm happy to talk to you about any questions you might have about this kind of stuff, okay guys? All right, so I hope you're all well, um, and I'll talk to you soon.